San Diego, from San Bernardino, from all over the place, Imperial County. Everybody was really interested in uh, participating in this event. How did you quit? So, um, all right. Uh, my name is Maya Trochimczyk. I'm a president of Mojeska Club. And here is this Professor Norman Davis, who just flew in yesterday from very far away. I had made a program. We have a lot of people and we don't have a podium, so we're going to have a kind of informal atmosphere. We've had also guests here in the club and we're really happy to have you and we'd like to talk to you about uh, some of the uh, issues you wrote about. Of course, we cannot cover a lot of it because you wrote about so many different issues and so many different... Well, that's his own thing. And uh, it's probably more suitable today to talk about uh, other things than, than European history. But I'll quickly mention what that lecture was about, because it may be of some interest. Uh, European history is usually seen around the world, either from the view of nations that were colonized by the Europeans, for example, Kuala Lumpur. Uh, the British were in Malaysia and they uh, look at European history through the eyes of people who were colonized by a European nation, Singapore, India, but above all. In India, I was born when uh, Delhi was in the, the British Empire. So it's all gone. But their view of European history is through the eyes of the Europeans who came to them. Uh, and quite often their memories are negative uh, for a variety of reasons. Um, uh, for example, in Tasmania, I think it was in Tasmania, uh, the entire population died as a result of the arri arrival of European, the British but mainly from disease. Europeans brought diseases with them, which were unfamiliar, and whole populations were wiped out uh, by uh, this disease. So quite often their, their memories are very negative. Uh, and what I was trying to, to tell them um, was that European history is much bigger than the history of the relations between the colonies and the various empires of Western Europe. For example, I told them that several parts of Europe 
like Eastern Europe, like Poland, were colonized by empires. The Russian Empire was the biggest empire in the history of the world. Russia is still the largest history in the world, and yet it doesn't seem to be included in the history of imperialism. It's always outside. Um, so I was telling them that uh, I was in no way apologizing for the history of European empires, but I was saying that the, the story is much bigger than you may think uh, if you live in wherever, Malaya or uh, New Zealand or Tahiti, uh, of course, the French. Can you imagine that French Polynesia, where I've been, is bigger than the whole of Europe? The, the, the surface area is bigger than the whole of Europe, uh, and it consists of 118 islands scattered around its vast area. Anyhow, that, that's quite a far. Well, so much for my little lecture about uh, uh, Europe, um, European Union, uh, and uh, Poland is a, an active member of NATO, i.e. it's an ally of the United States. The people who try to tell us that Poland is uh, in terrible danger from one direction or another. Uh, <clears throat> I'll just mention, uh, uh, give you a little picture of what, um, how, what part Poland played today. Uh, on the 9th of May, which is two or three weeks ago, I was in New Zealand. Uh, and it was Europe Day. The 9th of May is the end of the Second World War in Europe. Uh, it's the, the end of the war. The, it's the reason why the European movement has started, so that conflict of that sort will never happen again. Uh, and every 9th of May, uh, a Europe Day is held in all the countries connected. And in New Zealand, they had a, a little festival, uh, and... I was invited to talk to all the ambassadors of the European countries in Wellington. And it was in a very grand res residence of the, the French ambassador. But there was the Polish ambassador, lady ambassador. There was the uh, lady British representative, very interesting lady, Chinese origin from Hong Kong. Uh, there was the of course, the Frenchman who was um, presiding, the Dutchman, the German. Uh, the Polish representative was an equal partner of all the, uh, the European countries. And this is a huge change. It's not very long ago where no Polish representative would have been present. Uh, there were the, the Poles that have had no voice in councils of uh, you know, the international community, but now Poland is playing its, its full place. Now, a little switch, I, I think it's important. One thing is to understand how the former communist system worked. Um, it worked through a, an elaborate dictatorship centered in Moscow. Moscow controlled everything. The Polish Communist Party was controlled by the International Department of the Soviet Com uh, Communist Party in the Kremlin. Uh, and in one of my books I described this spider's web of, of controls that went right from the top all the way through the Soviet bloc, uh, through the Polish Communist Party to every village, every institution in Poland. Well, that spider's web has gone. It's broken up. Uh, there isn't a Soviet Communist Party in charge in Moscow anymore. So all these communists who uh, ran Poland until 20 years ago have no signals going to them. They were like robots with a wire, you know, and 
You know those little toys, those little motor cars, and you have a wire and a cable? Well, they're like those little toys and the cable. Uh, and I think a lot of people involved in that um, are uh, reacting to, uh, from a sort of sense of disorientation that they, that they, that they had uh, in the 1980s when solidarity was... Um, was active, or in the 1990s when a new system was being created. When the Pope came to Poland in 1979, June 1979, did anybody see him? Yes. Not on the television, I mean on the, in Krakowie. In Okay. Um, in that case, you remember his motto. It was Nielenkaitje. Mm -hmm. Don't be afraid. Don't um, don't give in. Be strong, morally strong. Uh, and um, uh, as a historian, I'm certain that this message was the psychological uh, impulse for solidarity. Solidarity broke out a year later. I don't think solidarity could possibly have had the courage to do what it did without this message that had come from the, the Polish Pope. Uh, don't be afraid. Now, the Pope has gone, and we've got a number of voices. I won't name them, but you'll have recognize what I mean, who are saying, you must be terribly afraid. You must be afraid of Russia. Mr. Putin is waiting to pounce. You must be frightened of the Germans. They are trying to um, uh, overpower Poland, not through tanks anymore, but through money. You must be uh, frightened of the European Union. It's... Uh, you know, a terrible organisation which takes all our money away from us and gets nothing back. These were voices of fear, and you can hear them on the radio, um, are exactly the opposite of what the Pope was saying. Uh, and I think any good Pope, any good Catholic should think twice before they repeat them. It's, uh, it's unfortunate that perhaps inevitable uh, <coughs> in a country where one system collapsed, a lot of people lost out, um, uh, but still a large element of the population which is, is struggling, especially older people, people again who couldn't adapt. Young people, I think, generally speaking, are doing very well. Uh, but there is a, quite a substantial group of people in Poland who are vulnerable to this sort of suggestion that you must be afraid. Uh, and I hope you don't uh, wish to believe all that. Uh, and in today's globalized world, it's impossible for middle-sized countries like Poland to prosper and to have a strong voice if, if they have no friends and allies. Um, it, it's as simple as that. In today's world, the United States is not big enough or strong enough to decide everything itself. Uh, I, I've been to India. getting bigger and stronger and richer every day. Uh, uh, China. These are huge influential powers of the 21st century. And a country like Poland, 40 million. Britain, 60 million. No, even Germany, 80 million, is too small to compete without allies. Uh, so, 
your observations, I think, are absolutely correct. Um, as a member of a block, it's quite, it's relatively safe. You can't ever say that there's no danger in the world at all. Um, I mentioned Mr. Putin. A lot of this, I actually met Mr. Putin in Smolensk in, uh, on the 7th of April, 2010. And it was absolutely clear to me that he wanted to put an end to these historical disputes. Uh, he was the first ever Russian leader to go to Katyn. Uh, and uh, Putin is, is running a huge ramshackle state. Uh, which doesn't work very well. Uh, it lives by selling oil. Uh, and if Putin can't sell his oil to Europe, he's finished. So he's not going to mess around with the Poles. He's worried about the Chinese, about the Caucasus, Georgia, all these other places. And, you know, net, let's not exaggerate the, the threat from, uh, from Putin. I, I don't particularly like Mr. Putin, but... Uh, <laughs> Um, I found out I was exactly the same height as him. <laughs> when the Pope came to Poland in 1979, June 1979, did anybody see him? Yes. Not on the television, I mean on the in Krakowie. In Wrocław. Okay. Um, in that case, you remember his motto. It was, Don't be afraid. Don't, um, don't give in. Be strong, morally strong. Uh, and um, uh, as a historian, I'm certain that this message was the psychological uh, impulse for solidarity. Solidarity broke out a year later. I don't think solidarity could possibly have had the courage to do what it did without this message that had come from the, the Polish Pope. Uh, don't be afraid. Now, the Pope has gone, and we've got a number of voices. I won't name them, but you'll have recognize what I mean, who are saying, you must be terribly afraid. You must be afraid of Russia. Mr. Putin is waiting to pounce. You must be frightened of the Germans. They are trying to um, uh, overpower Poland, not through tanks anymore, but through money. You must be uh, frightened of the European Union. It's... Uh, you know, a terrible organization which takes all our money away from us and gives nothing back. These were voices of fear, and you can hear them on the radio, um, are exactly the opposite of what the Bob was saying. Uh, and I think any good Paul, any good Catholic should think twice before they repeat them. It's, uh, it's unfortunate that perhaps inevitable uh, in a country where one system collapsed, a lot of people lost out, um, uh, but still a large element of the population which is, is struggling, especially older people, people again who couldn't adapt. The young people, I think, generally speaking, are doing very well. Uh, but there is a, quite a substantial group of people in Poland who are vulnerable to this sort of suggestion that you must be afraid. Uh, and I hope you don't uh, wish to believe all that. Say something about 1683, uh, Sobieski and Vienna. I was trying to tell my kids uh, that how important it is. He told me, Mom, if it were important, it would be in my textbook here in California. Therefore, it's not important. How important was that? Uh, 
Important for whom? Uh, it was very important for the, the Turks, who thought they were on the brink of uh, overpowering Central Europe. Uh, as you know, they, they lost out. Um, I think there's a big problem, actually, for every country of exaggerating the victories and the defeats that we all met along, along the way. Um, uh, Sobieski is not my big hero. Sobieski made a mess of the government of Poland, Lithuania. Uh, he went to Vienna because the emperor offered him a large sum of money. And he was much better on the battlefield than he was um, running the, the country. Um, and as you know, when Sobieski died, that was when the Russians came in and got a grip on the old com Commonwealth. So um, I don't think military heroes are, um, you know, the greatest uh, figures. Of course, um, all countries have their uh, military heroes. But, you know, uh, is Admiral Nelson in um, your Californian textbook? Probably not. He is, is he? Oh, well, the Americans have a few more connections with, uh, with the British. Um, but I, I, so my, my wife is Polish, and when uh, she first came to London from, uh, from Paris, we, we met in France, and she arrived in Waterloo Station. And she said, Waterloo? Why do you celebrate a great defeat? <laughs> um, um, Stan Chick, as you know, was the king's jester. Uh, he um, was the only person in the uh, Yagilon court who could speak and not be punished for what he said. And um, this is a good role model for a historian, I think. <laughs> as, as you know, the, the historical school that grew up in Krakow in the 19th century was called the Stanchi Group. And that was one of the first, uh, uh, the first Polish historians that I became uh, familiar with. I'm curious, why did you decide to study Polish history? Um, I think about it. Is, was it because of your wife? Not true, not true, not true. No. <laughs> there, there's a lot of mythology in uh, um, by, by, by accident. Um, uh, as a young man in my 20s, I uh, like learning languages, I was collecting languages and so on. I went to Poland completely by mistake. Um, <laughs> found that it was rather uh, interesting, um, partly because the official guide that was given to this group of British students had instructions not to tell us anything, uh, uh, and she eventually uh, relented. For example, she had orders not to tell these British students about the Warsaw Rising. In Warsaw. And we'd go around and we'd say, you know, this whole city was destroyed. Why, why, why was it destroyed? And she'd say, the war, the war. Said, but yes, but what happened? The war. And that was all she was prepared to say until we, we kept pestering her till eventually she took us into a park where, <laughs> uh, and she told us about the Warsaw Rising. So uh, that made me very interested if there must be more of these stories. Uh, but I was also uh, impressed by uh, uh, what your son said. There was nothing about uh, Poland, Polish history, in our textbook, or very little. Uh, but I had the opposite conclusion. I said, well, if it's not in the textbook, then it must be really important. <laughs> Ah, um, I'm having a bit of a rest. I think it comes.
cost me more blood and sweat in the editing than any previous book. Uh, nearly two years of my life were taken up uh, finishing that off, so I, I've been having a rest. Uh, the next book will be in Polish. It's a Vivia um, Dzeka. How do you translate that into English? In, in extended interview, something like that. A, um, a long interview of about 300 pages with no chapters, just, as it were, continuous conversation. Um, talking about um, my experiences. The uh, reason, the pretext for that is it's exactly 50 years last month since I first went to Poland by mistake. Uh, so this book is uh, recounting what's happened to me in the uh, intervening decades. Um, there'll probably be a book of, uh, of essays. I collect essays, you know, I give lectures and all the time, and from time to time I issue a book of essays. Have you read Europe, East and West? Have you seen that one? Yes, okay, it'll be something like that, but I, uh, there'll be a number of sketches from this journey, um, places, uh, some of the places I've been to. Uh, that's enough. <laughs>